Good day. Back in 2014, when the Obama administration announced the first major round of sanctions against Russia in connection with the situation in Ukraine, the Chinese government was extremely reticent and said very little. Indeed, I can remember at that time that some Russian commentators were disappointed by the silence from China and felt let down. This time, it is very different. The Chinese have condemned US sanctions on Russia, and they've done so in the usual strong language, which is becoming increasingly China's trademark when discussing such matters and when discussing the actions of the US. These are the words used by China's foreign ministry spokesperson, Lao Zhao Lixian, during a briefing on Friday. To wantonly resort to unilateral sanctions or the threat of sanctions in international relations constitute power politics and hegemonic bullying. Such behaviour is being rejected more and more by the international community. Russia and the US are both permanent members of the UN Security Council and major powers with important global influence. Both shoulder important responsibilities for international peace and security. We hope relevant parties will resolve differences through consultation and dialogue. So there we are. Um, power politics and hegemonic bullying. That is how China characterizes the sanctions that the US has just imposed on Russia. Very strong language, uh, um, language which, as I said, in 2014, one didn't hear. Well, there's a number of points to be made here. Firstly, obviously, since 2014, relations between the United States and China have changed radically. Back in 2014, China and the United States, at that time led by President Barack Obama, had, at least on the surface, cordial, if not actually warm or friendly relations. Obama was already carrying out the famous or perhaps infamous pivot to the East. The Chinese were taking steps in response. They were building up, they started the build-up of their naval forces, there was a growing wariness by each side of the other. However, the Chinese at that time were still looking to keep relations on an even keel, and they were very careful, even though they were forging ahead with incre increasingly close relations with Russia, not to appear to commit to Russia too strongly so as not to annoy and exacerbate relations with the Americans. By the way, this was the time when the Russians and the Chinese finally resolved the complex negotiations about Russian uh, building of Russian pipelines to China and Russian provi Russia providing gas supplies to China. And there was an important meeting in the summer of, of 2016. This is uh, um, two years later between Vladimir Putin and President Xi Jinping, in which it became increasingly clear how close the relationship between the Chinese and the Russians had become. But, as I said, at that time, the Chinese were anxious to do nothing to make the situation with the United States appear even worse than it was gradually becoming. They didn't want to exacerbate an increasingly tense relationship, they were still hoping to reach some sort of modus vivendi with the United States. So what has changed? Well, what has changed, I think, is two things. Firstly, there was a shift in relations with between the US and China uh, over the time when the Donald Trump was president. However, it's important to say that though Donald Trump focused very strongly on taking action against China, my overwhelming impression is that Trump himself was focused very heavily on trade and economic issues. He felt that the Chinese had been allowed too much access to the American market, 
that they'd been able to make use of that, to build up their own economy and their own industries at the expense of the United States. He felt that as a result, U.S. industries had been hollowed out and U.S. industrial workers had lost jobs. And he wanted to stop that and to put it into reverse. So the result was a complicated succession of trade negotiations between China and the U.S. and increasingly higher tariffs by the U.S. on Chinese goods. I don't think Donald Trump intended the relationship to spiral downward into outright geopolitical conflict. However, it's also the case that Donald Trump struggled to put together a coherent administration. And halfway through his time in office, he appointed um, unwisely to very hard line neocon uh, uh, advisers or politicians, Mike Pompeo as Secretary of State and John Bolton as National Security Advisor, who saw China not just as an economic challenge, but as an enemy and an adversary of US geostrategic dominance. And that caused relations to take a, a downward spiral even more. When the Biden Biden-Harris administration came to office in uh, the, at the start of this year, the Chinese may have had some hopes and expectations that things would change. But in fact, relations have actually got worse to an even greater extent. And it's now becoming increasingly clear that the primary objection on the part of the United States is not Chinese economic penetration of the American market. Something, by the way, which the Chinese can understand and work with and seek to find accommodations with the United States about, but a U.S. perception that China is now the U.S.'s great geopolitical and strategic rival, that it must be contained, that it must be pushed down, that it must, in fact, be treated in the same way that the United States once treated the Soviet Union. I've discussed at in numerous videos, this extraordinary long article or report which appeared on the website of the Atlantic Council, authored by someone called Atla uh, Anonymous, who is clearly connected in some way to the US administration, and who I suspect is either Secretary of State Bar Blinken or perhaps someone close to him, in which China is identified not just as an adversary but as an enemy, with President Xi Jinping of China in particular being talked about and discussed in the most extraordinary and vivid way, uh, in a manner one used to re one used to find uh, discussions in the U.S. about uh, Vladimir Putin or other leaders like Bashar al-Assad, Saddam Hussein, that kind of tone. And in fact, we've seen more of this uh, later. The latest assessment by the U.S. intelligence community um, um, challenges to the U.S. in 2021 has a very long section on China. And in fact, it is now the leading sec section. It prioritizes China over Russia. So now it is China, not Russia, which has become the United States' great enemy, adversary, and rival. Now, of course, Americans will say that it is China itself that has done this, that it is the Chinese, through their aggressive foreign policy, their wolf warrior language, their, um, their um, open comments about how the US is in decline, their predictions that they will take over, you know, from the United States as the world's leading hegemon, the th their threats against Taiwan and the rest. That is supposedly or allegedly what has provoked all of this. I have to say, I don't really see this at all. There was an editorial a short time ago in Global Times, which is a uh, semi-official newspaper 
um, owned by the Chinese, by the People's Daily, the official newspaper of China's co ruling Communist Party, which made, I thought, an extremely valid point, which is that China has not fired a shot in anger um, in recent years. It has not uh, um, threatened any country directly. The exception is Taiwan, but that is a special case which I'm going to devote a separate video to. And he has not sought regime change anywhere. The point that Global Times in its editorial made is that what has made the United States so hostile towards China is China's extraordinary economic growth and the nature of its political system, which is different from that of the United States. That is sufficient in itself to make the US see China as an adversary. The United States, according to the Chinese, not only cannot tolerate another country becoming richer and economically more powerful than itself, it especially cannot tolerate another country doing that whose political system differs significantly from that of the US itself. So, the Chinese feel themselves to be in a way that they did not feel themselves to be in 2014, under extraordinary and severe geopolitical pressure from the United States. And they're taking countermeasures. One of these countermeasures is, as we have seen, a, a strong build-up of China's um, um, military forces, especially its naval forces. This was discussed at length, by the way, in a live stream, which the Duran did on Friday, in which several of our commentators spoke about the speed of Chinese naval construction and the scale of Chinese naval deployments, all of which are clearly intended to counter the US Navy in the South China Sea and in the seas and territories adjoining China. Uh, but, of course, the other major step that China has been taking is the Belt and Road Initiative, which is clearly intended, in, in, at least in part, to provide China with access to world markets and to raw materials from around the world, which will not make China, which will lessen China's dependence on sea traffic through the Chi South China Sea, and above all, a de facto alliance, or as the Chinese prefer to say, strategic partnership with Russia, which protects China's northern border, provides China with raw materials, gas, oil, um, other strategic uh, minerals that Russia has in abundance, uh, grain and other food products, and a substantial amount of technology that the Russians also have. And this is the explanation, ultimately, for the Chinese decision to come out so strongly this time in support of Russia over the latest sanction spat between the United States and Russia. In addition, and moreover, I suspect that there is, behind all of this, a further calculation. There's much discussion in various uh, programmes and articles and websites about the fact that China is very much the senior partner um, in this uh, strategic partnership between China and Russia. And that, it must be said, is indeed the case. But it is also a fact that China needs Russia. It needs Russia to look after its northern border. It needs Russia for access to all that technology, to gas turbine technology, to aircraft engine technology, to uh, um, um, technology on, uh, um, on hardening uh, metals and creating metal alloys to building radar stations. The Russians are heavily involved in Chinese radar developments. And in fact, it's been confirmed that the Russians have actually been helping the Chinese build their early warning uh, system to protect themselves against uh, US ballistic missiles. In addition, 
and a, a fact that is often widely overlooked it is Russia, not China, that has by far the biggest nuclear deterrent force, which actually, um, in effect, limits US strategic options. To an extent that is still remarkable, China still hides under the Russian nuclear uh, umbrella, as it did for a short period in the 1950s. In itself, this is rather strange, but the indications are that it is something that the Chinese and the Russians have quietly agreed between each other should continue. Because though the Chinese have indeed uh, worked on building up their, Chinese, their, their own nuclear deterrence force against the United States, they have not done so to anything like the extent that one might have expected, given the fact that they are now in open competition with the United States. I suspect that from the Chinese point of view, the scale of the investment needed to build up a strategic defence force on the scale that the Russians and the Americans have deters them from doing it, and they prefer for the moment to work with the Russians and to um, hide, if you like, under the Russian nuclear umbrella rather than create their own. And that, of course, gives the Chinese that degree of confidence, which means that they can focus all their energies on building their um, fleet and, to some extent at least, scale down investment in their uh, land army and in their strategic nuclear deterrent force. So the Chinese do not want to see the Russians drifting back into the sort of semi-alliance uh, uh, um, that Russia and the United States briefly had in the 1990s. And I suspect that they're probably a little wary of any summit meeting that Putin has with Biden in, that, in the summer if that, um, if that summit happens at all. I am sure that over the last few days, the telephone lines between Moscow and Beijing have been extremely busy. And I think it is a virtual certainty that Putin and Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping have spoken to each other. We know that uh, they speak to each other regularly. Uh, there's even been hints that they speak to each other every week, though the fact is never confirmed and no readouts are ever provided on the Russian government's or the Chinese government's websites. So it is not surprising that the Russians, that the Chinese have come out so strongly this time in support of the Russians over the sanctions. And that, of course, in itself, by the way, lessens any impact of sanctions on Russia. Whether the United States appreciates the fact or not, the sanctions weapon is losing its effectiveness. Even if Russia were to be closed off entirely from access to European markets, be they financial markets or other markets, it, would, it now has a massive alternative market in China to which it can turn. Over the first quarter of this year, the Chinese economy has been surging as it has recovered from the partial lockdowns that took place last year. In the first quarter, year-on-year -year growth was 18%, which is astonishing and remarkable and Chinese economic growth this year is expected to be over 8%. This is a powerful motor that will pull the Russian economy along if it runs into trouble with the West. In the meantime, words are cheap and the Chinese are able to deploy those words very effectively, talking about 
power politics and hegemonic bullying, reminding the United States that they are there and that they're a strong power and that they're able to counter their moves and reminding the Russians that they are there as a friend also. Thank you for joining me for this programme on this channel. Please look up my other programmes, the other programmes that I do with my friend and colleague Alex Christoforou on our other channels, the Duran, and please also check out Alex's channel. You'll find uh, links under this video. Please check us out on our various platforms, uh, uh, BitChute, Library, Rumble, and especially Odyssey. Please support us to the extent that you can via PayPal, Patreon, and Subscribestar. And remember, we accept payments and donations in um, in uh, not in all currencies, including the new independent currencies that have been appearing. Please also join us on our Discord server. And last but not least, don't forget to check out our shop. The wonderful things you will find there: our hats, our hoodies, our sweatshirts our t-shirts, and above all, our famous magic mugs. Thank you for joining me for this programme. I look forward to you joining me in future programmes on this channel, and have a wonderful day.